Yeah, so, you know, in our quest here to try to add more scoring to our group, um, Eric was a player that, you know, we got calls on the last couple of days. Um, we like Tanner Pearson. Um, you know, he's been a 40, 45 point guy in the league. Um, you know, 24 goals a couple of years ago and then 15 last year. Um, we think that he's going to be a good fit with either playing with Petey or Bo. And, you know, he's just another guy that can score for us. So. edition of Agree or Disagree, the podcast. Yeah, I am Kevin Olenek. You can follow me on uh, Twitter at K-E-B-O-L-E. Spreaker, you can find all podcasts, K-E-B-O-L-E. Uh, SoundCloud, YouTube. Follow me on Facebook as well, Agree or Disagree, the podcast. And Agree or uh, Disagree, the podcast. And Kevin Olenek on Twitter. Uh, it has been an interesting week. Uh all across the NHL, and we're going to get into that with, we got here, Sean, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. And Tyler, I was thinking that, you know, um, as an official, you've had some times, and, and I'd always like to keep my guests a little bit comfortable, so I just wanted to play this for you, so you feel kind of familiar. I just felt like this is kind of, you know... I don't know how familiar you feel with this, but this is sort of that is for you. <laughs> so there, there, there we go. I, I haven't, I haven't been booed that badly. I've had the BS chant a couple of times from the whole arena, but uh, uh, boy, that was something on Long Island, eh? That was. We'll get into that. I think my opinion is a little controversial, but my uh, that, uh, <laughs> that yeah, that um, that was. I'll say it. I think that was the game that might have been one of the best games of the year. I know that it was a blowout, but it was just who wasn't watching that game, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot happened even before that, and we started this before, but uh, um, it was – I was all – I don't know if you guys were uh, sitting at around somewhere watching the trade deadline. I was at home watching the, the trade deadline, and there wasn't a lot going on until – 11.30, and then it all blew up, and then, um, lo and behold, uh, Eric Gabranson uh, was traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins for Tanner Pearson. Um, we've talked a lot about Eric Gabranson's fit in Vancouver. Uh, even Jim Benning said he wasn't really a fit here. It didn't work out here for whatever reason. Erica Branson admitted it never worked out here. Um, I, I, I guess I guess I admire him admitting that. I don't think that there would be a lot of hockey players who admit his time here, his time in whatever organization that didn't work wouldn't work. I really kind of have to give him a lot of respect for owning his struggles. Yeah, um, he definitely he definitely owns up a bit to start but there was uh, the comment afterwards um after i think it was like first or second practice where he uh basically said that uh the the system didn't fit him and started to make a little little bit of excuses here or there just seems to me like he he's lost all his confidence and is trying to get it back whatever however he he can and sometimes you gotta like show show a little bit of uh, like acceptance and then but he also he passed the buck a bit i i think based off of those comments hmm. uh it was unusual to kind of hear that type of press conference on the way out um but it, it just it, tangibly it just wasn't getting better for him it was just getting worse and worse he was having his ice time cut so he was probably looking for a new opportunity at that point as well 
Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I think probably there was a part of him, maybe he never really asked for a trade, but he just kind of was hoping it would happen. He didn't expect it to be happening um, as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of fit that he is in, in Pittsburgh. I feel like at Pittsburgh, they're really desperate for defense uh, overall. They had Brian Jubilant injured, Crystal Tang was never healthy, so... Uh, it's it's that's going to be fascinating. But the guy that got that he got back uh, did not play on Monday, obviously. But he has ten goals, six assists, sixteen points, uh, minus fourteen. He's had a rough time. He got traded earlier in the year from L.A. to Pittsburgh for Carl Hagelin. Um I actually don't think he looks. You know, I mean, I know it's early. Uh, and it's only two games, but I did not think he looked out of sorts uh, with the Canucks at the start. I did not mind him on a line with Pedersen and Levo. I don't know what you think, but I, I thought he was a he was a pretty good fit. Yeah, he looks he looks like he could be a, a good addition, uh, but uh, he just sort of adds to the glutton of sort of middle six wingers that the Canucks have uh, going into the rest of the season and into next year. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with them going forwards. I did like his, um, I did like his first game, even though he did um, get a point. I felt that um, he had some chemistry with uh, like Ryan Spooner, as well as uh, looked good with uh, creating, uh, going down and cycling down low. So I think it's, there's a spot for him to, to take. But there's uh, there's uh, definitely spots for all those all those guys to take going forwards. Uh, both Spooner and Pearson are, are part of that, as you say, Sean, the glutton of middle six wingers. Uh, but the Canucks are not subtracting from the future to bring them in and give them a try and see what they can offer while others are injured. So um, I like the deal. I, it's great for Pittsburgh too, as you mentioned, Kevin. I mean, they're desperate for a defenseman, so it works pretty well for both sides and uh yeah Pearson's been a, it's only been two games but he's been a presence you know almost scored in the game against Colorado and then got his first as a Canuck uh the following night against Arizona yeah uh yeah I, I think it, it, it'll be interesting to see what he, he does go forward there's there's sort of there on one hand you you get optimistic and then the other other hand I'm reminded of Brendan Leipzig who got off to such a great start uh, after the acquisition last year, and didn't turn out, did not turn out as well. So I feel like there's some caution. We'll get into the winger situation a little bit, but we do need to quickly talk about. I, I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this. But Jonathan Dahlin was traded. Uh, it turned out to San Jose for Linus Carlson, a guy that not a lot of people have seen. So we don't know a lot about what he is. So I don't know if it's going to be very valuable to talk about Linus Carlson. We got into it a little bit, uh, uh, Dolan last week. But what I thought was kind of interesting was what Benning said a little bit about Dolan. I'm going to play a little bit here. Um, you know, he's been kind of up and down in his development. Um, and so we just felt like, you know, we really liked the player we were getting back. And so we made the deal. Did you just feel there was no upside with, with Dolan whatsoever? And that's why you decided to make the No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that. I think there's upside to Jonathan's game. Um, I don't maybe necessarily think there, there was a fit to the, the style of game that our team or our organization likes to play. Uh, with speed and skill, like speed and you know uh, pressuring pucks and you know getting in, getting in hard, getting to the net and stuff. Uh, we worked, you know, with them all year on those. It just felt a little bit. There's a lot of con. We're not going to get into Utica too much, but I guess the, the, I just found it kind of fascinating what Benning said about Dollin. It was, I take it a little bit as an indictment of Jonathan Dollin. I I mean I know that maybe the player doesn't feel that he was a fit and it's quite possible the style wasn't a fit, but reading between the lines from what I'm hearing Benning say, there was a lot about this guy that didn't seem to be a fit in the overall organization of what they were looking for as a person, not only a player. Yeah, I think there's uh there was definitely a miss uh a misconnect between um where 
where Dolan felt he was in his development and the Canucks felt he was, because I don't think there was any sort of um, um, demand for NHL playing time from Jonathan Dolan, but I think he was looking for more of just more more ice time and more consistent ice time in Utica. But Trent Call and Ryan Johnson down in Utica didn't believe he was ready because he wasn't um, he wasn't playing the full Canucks style hockey that they're looking for, uh, which includes like just a, a hard four check, which if you if you want to do draw a little bit of a parallel between Dolan and, and Goldobin, if you look at the last three games for you we've seen from Goldobin where he's really turned it turned it around and become uh, a player where that uh, Green's willing to play, as we saw um, where he uh, last game where he got uh, nearly twenty minutes. Um, he's he's going down and, and forechecking hard and and getting the puck back. And I don't think that was what I don't think uh, Dolan was uh, doing that consistently enough for for the liking of the organization. And I don't think he was he sh- was showing a willingness to was going to do that uh, going forwards. Uh, Jim Benning made a reference to he, certain players and and, and Dolan in particular not wanting to pay their dues, and that's something that Dolan denied, but. Uh, it's pretty clear how the organization handles its younger players. They don't just hand spots to guys. And so somewhere there was a disconnect on, in terms of how long it was going to be before he was going to get his shot. And I guess uh, I guess uh, his agent there, J.P. Barry, figured it's time to explore other possibilities. I mean, Benny even admitted it's a, a lateral move. So he's, you know, he's conceded to everybody. It, it was we have to move on from this guy as opposed to a, a hockey deal to try and improve the club. So it's a bit troubling, uh, but this wasn't a Canuck draft pick. This was a guy acquired by trade as well. So um, I, I don't know. I guess they don't all work out, but um, it's, a, it's a little, it's a, it's a concern for sure. You know, especially if this, uh, this, the guy that comes back turns out not to be very much. Yeah. I think the other issue was that uh, going back to last year, um, and him, him move, going back to Sweden uh, after having mono, I don't think uh, necessarily um, endeared him to the organization uh, in any any shape or form. And maybe that was the right move for for Dahl in it, but it just didn't. Uh, I don't think it came across in the right uh, light for him to the the Trent calls, the Ryan Johnsons, the the Jim Bennings. Hmm. What about? Because there was, this isn't the first one, because there's two arguments on this, because there was the Petrus Pomo argument, because he went back, and there's some are saying, okay, there is an issue in, this tells me that there's there's got to be a little bit of a problem in Utica, but the other argument is, as a guy like Petrus Pomo, the reality is, is there would have been about a 5% chance of a guy like Petrus Pomo developing into uh, a, a pure NHL talent because of where he was drafted. He was a low draft pick. Do you see this as a, a question with Dolan is, or with Utica, or what do you kind of are you concerned with Utica, or should there be a concern, or just? I don't think there should be a concern. I think if you're looking at the way the top the top teams end up uh, producing players, is you if you can get one or two. Uh, it players out of the AHL every year or year and a half, I think you're doing really well because your top players aren't enough. If you, if you're drafting well, your first, your first round pick is not necessarily going to spend much time down in, in down in your AHL team. They should be going straight to your NHL team. If you're drafting well, especially if you're where the Canucks are drafting top 10 um, for a few years. And then your, so it's going to be your second round and third round picks, uh, and later who are going to need time to develop, and not uh, and not they're not always going to turn out. So, and I think, but I think the one issue right now with with Utica and the disconnect between what the organization is doing and trying to do and what the expectations of the fan base is 
is with Utica is they're trying to start, they have spots for these young players, but they're also they're also trying to be competitive as well and surround them with good uh, sort of AHL veterans that can help them develop. While the fans just want to see as much of the young kids as possible, we're seeing that uh, up at the, at the uh, NHL level a little bit too with uh, the Goldobins uh, um, not getting the ice time and and Vertanen throughout the last last little bit, uh, the last couple of years as well, not getting the ice time that the fan base is wanting. In regards to you, <clears throat> excuse me. In regards to Utica, uh, I guess people have forgotten that. Jacob Markstrom spent uh, a whole bunch of time there working on his game, and that turned mm-hmm. out to to be quite successful. Went on a run to the Calder Cup, but that was so long ago; people have forgot now. Mm. That's a good so point. It's not all failures there. I mean, a farm system's a farm system. It, it does take, uh, it, you know, there's going to be hits and misses. There's going to be guys that take longer than than others. Uh, some sometimes the farm team has to get ends up getting depleted for a while because of injuries, so the team as a whole starts to struggle. That, that's how I see it. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point about Markstrom, and yeah, it's uh, yeah, I don't, I it, it, it's fascinating because there's it's. <sighs> Yeah, there's, it, 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 it is interesting because we're, we're seeing players asked to be moved. But we're hearing players asked to be moved. I wouldn't be surprised if this happens probably a little bit more than we care to admit. Probably in a bunch of organizations, there are guys that expect to be, because of the consideration that I'm a top prospect, I should be treated a little bit differently than everybody else. I, 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 don't, yeah. know if, I don't know if what I'm hearing from Dolan is really any different than anywhere else. I imagine this happens everywhere. And, and there's a lot of wordsmithing that goes on too, right? Is it is it request a trade or is it, you know, prefer something different, different opportunity? I mean, you know, you could spin it whichever way you want. Um, if if player and the organization are not on the same page, then uh, you got an issue. Yeah, and, uh, Tyler, you're right in terms of how the player, agent, and organization uh, frame uh, what the conversation actually was. Because I don't actually, based off of what I'm hearing, I don't think the there was a quote-unquote trade demand. I think there was a discussion on finding a new opportunity for jo- Jonathan Dahl, whether that was within the organization or or outside of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I think, probably the most uh, accurate way to put it. Yeah. I guess we'll find out really what happens when he what he does in San Jose. If he's a player there, okay. If he's not, he's not right. If and that's not an easy organization to crack. Anyway. Um, no. So current the current lineup, forward lineup right now, uh, according to Canucks Army, uh, and that this could always change tomorrow when the uh, Canucks play the Golden Knights. Horvat, Goldobin, Besser, Pedersen. Pearson, Levo, Gaudet, Roussel, Spooner, Beagle, Erickson, Mott. Uh, well, I'm also forgetting to mention, because they're not in the lineup right now, Sven Berchi, uh, Bre- uh, Sutter, Jake Vertanen. So I'd like to, we're going to play a little bit of a game here of who's here in 2019. Uh, so, because as Sean mentioned, this is a quite a glut of wingers and Probably in the same level of wingers. There's not really, other than Brock Besser, uh, it's hard to say that there's a top three, hard to argue that there's a top three winger in this group. So going into next year, who are you hoping is here and who would you hope is gone? I hope that they can, if if this, I hope they find a way to, to keep gold open because if we're seeing what he can be in the past, in the last three games, that's someone who can help them uh, going forwards. I like Josh Levo. I think he brings uh, some grit. Uh, he's got a, a very uh, underrated shot. Uh, Jake Bertanen's speed is something that uh, is missing from the rest of that group. And then you've got and then you've got uh, Spooner and Pearson. That uh, we'll need to um, find, like either get moved or find spots for. But that being said, um, you also have to look at if there, if 
we all if if they all are all around the same level, who has the most trade value? Who can help the Canucks bring in something that they they need to to take that next step, which is likely a right side defenseman. Maybe that's Jake Vertanen uh, that you have to move to um, to help acquire that. So it's for me. I like Goldobin as your as a playmaking um, winger. I like. I like um, Josh Levo as a as a grinded out uh, sort of big bodied guy, but uh, you know, Tanner Pearson can also play that role. So I think those two are sort of fighting it out. Uh, Ryan Spooner sort of fits that same role as Goldobin as a bit more of a playmaker. So that's where it's tough because basically I, I see Levo staying, I see Goldobin staying. And then I see um, Vertanen, uh, Pearson, and Spooner battling it out for that last spot. Uh, the guy for me uh, that uh, I'm starting to lose a little patience with is is Sven Berchi, and it's and it's not a, a slight on you know the, the guy. It's just he's injured so much, you know, and it's just it's hard. He's not on the ice enough for them to like be able to count on him. It, it feels like. And and there's somebody that might be able to net some return in a trade. I know they gave up quite a bit. I think it was a second round pick and maybe some more to get no, him it's just Calgary. a second. Just a second, okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you know, and then they, they've been really high on him, and they 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 like the chemistry there with Horvat, but he's just not playing enough to to be reliable long term. And I don't see that changing. Well, I don't even know if what what his long term future looks like, too. Yeah, he's been he's out with a concussion. Yeah, yeah. So, and, that, that, so that's the, that's a bit of a frustration for me. But I, I agree with uh, you, Sean. I, Levo and, and Goldobin are are guys that need to stay. I, I think they, they 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 fit in nicely. They they what they bring to the offense are are, are different elements. And uh, as long as you got uh, the other pieces correct, they fit in nice. Yeah, what's interesting too is I, I realized this after we we talked about it uh, in prep for this is that we listed all those players off and uh, who's missing the six million dollar man Louis Erickson. Yeah, yeah, he's basically a fourth liner now, and uh, if they could find a way to move move on from him, whether that's uh, say um, trading him with uh, something to to Ottawa so that they can ha- they can get above the the uh, cap floor next year, uh, or I think there's a, I think, I can't remember who, but I remember seeing uh, someone uh, on Twitter put a, a scenario out there where if that uh, there is a, a way that uh, if, if um, Erickson doesn't want to play, um, wants to maybe, say maybe go back to go, go to Europe and play or something like that, there is a way for them to uh, mutually uh, dissolve the contract or if he retires um so if there's if there's a way to get uh, to move on from louis erickson that helps this glutton of uh of wingers too because then you can knock knock one of the like a, a tanner pearson down to the fourth line or something like that yeah there hasn't been much uh speculation about whether erickson would be willing to waive the no trade clause that he has uh I suppose the cynical view would be if the coach is burying him on the fourth line that he'd be willing to waive it, but I, I'm not so sure. It's uh, hard, hard to get a read on that situation if he'd be fine with, with staying regardless of role or, or what, but um, could actually probably have to retain some salary in the, whatever transaction they, they make if, they, if they're able to do one. What, what would be the cost of a buyout? It's not worth it. Uh, the way that his contract is, is structured, is that he doesn't? Uh, it it doesn't it doesn't work. So it would uh, you'd have more cap savings. Um, like it's just it's almost almost most worth it just to bury him in the minors. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think a buyout's a possibility until you're in the final year. Yeah. Hmm. By the way, to add to something here, because I was just looking up, seeing who said that, but Tyler who was on a couple of weeks ago, pointed, added Reed Boucher to this conversation because he's now set a single-season record in Utica for goals. Uh, he, his tweet put Louie in the press box and let's get some of these goals in Vancouver. So 
Maybe, maybe, maybe not Reed Boucher is in this conversation. I don't think Reed Boucher is in this conversation. I think that Reed Boucher proved no. that he's a he's a fine Utica player, but I don't think he's quite an NHL player. But yeah, he's one of those tween like like AHL superstars. Just doesn't have the speed to to play at the NHL level. Yeah, he can't get to the spot. He can't get to the spots uh, fast enough to get to get his shot off. So when you mentioned what can we get for Jake for Tannen, I my gut just there's something about this that, that like I know that he hasn't turned out, but th- why is there a hesitation for me for wanting to trade Jake for Tannen? Am I? It's because he has that. He still has a. He's got the size. He's got the speed, and if he can get on, I think if he can get on a line that uh, can find a way to open up space for him to use his shot, he could be a 20, 25 goal scorer pretty consistently. Um, all, all of those things, plus he was a sixth overall pick for the organization. It, like, it's, it's really, really hard for, for me to, to see them pulling the plug on that. And again, I mean, we can all be optimistic about what you'd get in a return in a trade, but I, I think it wouldn't be quality over quantity, I, I don't think. So, uh, no, they got to stick with him. He has bite to his game, and when, and when he's uh, when he's got it figured out, he's very effective. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's he's, it's because it's such an interesting guy. But I mean, maybe if a guy like Michael Furland does not return to Carolina, that Carolina would be would be an interesting place for him for a, a Dougie Hamilton or and they do have some right shot pieces there. Not only Dougie Hamilton, but they got some other ones there too. That could be an interesting fit. I'm not saying that that happens, but that, that's an interesting fit. Um, and I don't think Jim, you know, I know that Jim Benning, there's a lot of people that are really hard on Jim Benning in this in this market, but he does not get enough credit for this Josh Lebo trade. I think that this is one of his better trades because it almost allows you to have a conversation about trading Jake Furtanen because Josh Lebo does a lot of Jake Furtanen things. So you're not really missing out if Lebo continues on this pace. In my mind, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, yeah that Levo trade. It was just uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe they had a bit of a, an agreement in it where after they sent Sam Gagne down to the Marlies for a bit or what. But whatever <laughs> Jim Jim Benning did to to get that Levo trade for what uh, is essentially just an AHL player is just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mean. It, it's kind of odd, I guess, uh, given the narratives around Jim Benning and his ability to make good trades, that, that this one is such a I'm not, I'm maybe lopsided is too strong a word, but it, clearly the Canucks uh, got the better end of the deal um, from an organization that was desperate to free up a roster spot and some salary cap space with uh, William Nylander being signed. So uh, you, have, uh, you have Jim Be- Benning, who's a pretty experienced executive, working with Kyle Dubas, who's in his first year as a general manager, and... Uh, Guess who won the trade? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating what happens in the off season uh, with that. We'll we'll get into that a little bit more because as as of this point, um, we're probably in off season mode. Five points out, losing two in a row, uh, have to pass one, two, three, four teams to get that last wild card spot. It is going to be tough. Uh, but who knows? You never know what is going to happen. But one of the things that is becoming uh, quite fascinating here is the goaltending situation. Because last couple weeks ago, we had Michael DiPietro play his first game. And then Thatcher Demko played his first game against Arizona. Or not his first game. It was it was one of his first games. It was his first game in a really long time. Uh, and yeah. he played like it was his first game in a really long time. It wasn't. Great. He wasn't happy himself about it. Um, but what do you do with Thatcher Yemko going forward? Do you, in, in the final uh, 17, 18 games here, how much time do you give him? I I hope he gets at least three, four starts uh, in the next, in the next in the, to, to finish off the season because I, they need to really give him some uh, some more looks and see see what uh, what he can do with that. With the NHL at the NHL level, 
and yeah, like we like you said there, Kevin, it was uh, it looked definitely looked like he had some rust um, in that Arizona game, and but uh, yeah, like give give him three, four, maybe even more starts, and and see and 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 give him some confidence going into the into the uh, off season because he's not he's not going back down to Utica. Uh, at the end of the season because they did paper him down there for the playoffs. So just uh, give him as much, give him, get him in there as much as possible, especially once the, the, the playoff dream is, uh, is officially, uh, it, um, out. They got 17 games left. I, I would like to see six starts from Demko. That's about a third of the workload. They've uh, worked Markstrom pretty hard here. Uh, I mean, they are technically still in it, but they're six points back, and most of the teams around them have a game in hand. As you mentioned, uh, Kevin, there's uh, uh, several teams in front of them uh, to get above the uh, playoff bar, so it, it's not realistic uh, anymore. Uh, if, you, if you measured the social media reaction during the Arizona game, there was this feeling of it's over. Uh, even uh, John Shorthouse and John Garrett on the broadcast uh, kind of – conveyed that tone as well so um they're they're, the priority should now be development and and getting guys playing time that need to get the playing time yeah it's i I mean do you would you play him against vegas there was a a debate about that would you play him tomorrow in in vegas no i'd go back to markstrom but beyond that uh you know, we'll see. I have to bring up the schedule here, but beyond the uh, Demko just played, and, and they have a couple of days off here, so you should go back to March for sure. Well, they do have a back to back against Toronto and Edmonton coming up here, um, which I could see. You could put Demko in against the Oilers. That may not be such a bad thing, um, but I mean, I would yeah, like I'd, to see him get a home I'd, start though, too. Yeah, I'd play him against Edmonton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the marquee game there is obviously the Toronto game. You want to have your number one goalie in net for that one. Yeah, yeah, and that would yeah, that, I wouldn't put Demko there, but I would like to see him get a couple of home ones. Um, I'm going to say this may sound a little bit ridiculous, but um, I it's a fair debate that say that it's it's between Markstrom and Pedersen how you look at that he's the Canucks and who the Canucks MVP is, but. Um, for the last few months, I think there's a legitimate argument that Jacob Markstrom has is playing. Maybe he's not, but he is playing as one of the top three to five goaltenders in the National Hockey League. I don't know if he's getting enough credit for for what this guy has actually done because he has been nothing short of almost phenomenal this year. Yeah, he had that rough that rough stretch in in November. Um, but after that, he's been, yeah, he's been really good. Actually, sorry, he had a rough stretch in, in November, and then December he was back to sort of what we expected. But 2019, so the we've got now two full, two, I would say two and a half full months, I would say, that we'd, we're looking at uh, him playing at, yeah, I would say uh, arguably one of the top, uh, top five uh, to seven. Uh, goaltenders in in the NHL, even top three to five, like you said there, Kevin. I, I think the Hockey Night in Canada panel certainly shows their love for Markstrom when uh, they play on a Saturday. But uh, outside of that, yeah, there isn't a lot of talk about uh, about Markstrom when you you're hearing about Carey Price and and uh, Freddie Anderson and other goalies in bigger markets all the time. But uh, uh, top three to five, I mean, I would say. Maybe more in that five to seven range, probably for goalies just going around the league. But uh, uh, he he's grabbed a lot of people's attention as as far as uh, being able to keep this up over this length of time and this amount of workload. Yeah, and a in a in a league that doesn't have a lot of number ones, it's it's very interesting what you do with Markstrom because I I was just thinking about this. I mean, he's got a cap hit of about 3.6. Yeah. He's 29. Uh, We're learning now that 30 is old. I don't know if uh, what you want to do with that, but is this a guy that you want to keep a little bit longer than we anticipated? Is this a guy that may need a new contract? I mean, three is a little high for a goalie maybe, but 
I think that that's why you want to play Demko more because you, you do need to see what you got there in order what to do with Markstrom or how long you want to keep Markstrom around. Yeah, you still have one more year to, to make that decision too. He's signed uh, through to the end of uh, next season, so you gotta yeah you gotta you gotta start seeing what you have with Demko and then go from there. Yeah. Um, at this point in time. We'll just note in terms of goaltending statistics here, Robin Leonard leads the league in both uh, goals against average and save percentage with a minimum of 21 or more games played. So, uh, And then there's still some other names there like Vasilevsky and uh, 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 Rask and Halak. And yeah, I mentioned Carey Price that uh, are still doing some impressive things. Marc-Andre Fleury. So, yeah, there's a lot of competition for goalies uh, in terms of impressive numbers that that's where uh, I think uh, a little bit of the credit starts to disappear for Jacob Markstrom yeah yeah I I mean how I I know I had Robin Leonard as one of the top goalies coming into the National Hockey League in 2018-19 myself so you know yeah but but it is interesting because it just because it yeah I don't I think his value to this team is is becoming more and more important going forward, and I think it's it's going to be quite fascinating what you do with him. And um, I suspect that that's going to be a big talking point next year. And if they're not in a playoff spot next year, um, he could be a very valuable trade chip. But he's also maybe a guy you still want to keep. It's very it's it's kind of fascinating. I mean, I know thirty years old now, but well, not for goalies. No, that's no, true. Yeah. Go, like goalies, yeah, the, you can you can play a pass thirty with with the right uh, style, and 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 I think Mark Markstrom with his size uh, is someone that can. Yeah. yeah. And just just looking at his Markstrom splits in in February, he played twelve games, had four wins, five losses, three uh, in overtime. Had a nine thirty save percentage and a two thirty one goals against average. Yeah, it's yeah, that's that's pretty pretty dang impressive. Um, and there, his run support is one of the lowest in the league too. So that that doesn't help him in any way, shape, or form. But yeah, it's it's proof if you get a bit more if that power play got going. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> It, it this is this is a bit of a different conversation, I think for sure. And maybe if this power play gets going, Markstrom is in the Vesna conversation. I might be so bold to say that, but who knows? Because um, those are pretty pretty damn good numbers. Um, so there was the trade deadline on Monday. As mentioned, we talked a little bit about Eric Gabrans and we talked a little bit about Jonathan Dolan. But the big moves, the big fish, the big catch. Uh, was Mark Stone, who was acquired by the Las Vegas Golden Knights after Calgary was in, after Winnipeg was in, after a bunch of other teams were in. It turned out that Mark Stone, and I believed yesterday he did sign his uh, contract extension to be with the Golden Knights for the next eight or nine years. Uh, The Blue Jackets doubled down. They ended up getting Ryan Dezingle and Adam McQuaid. the Winnipeg Jets ended up with Kevin Hayes. The San Jose Sharks came up with Gustav Nyquist. Uh, the Flames did not do much. Got uh, Oscar Fattenberg, but did fall out of all of the other ones. Wayne Simmons to Nashville. What were your big? Who's your big winners slash losers of the trade deadline? I guess maybe we'll start with what your thoughts of st- Stone to Vegas. I guess we'll we'll start there. But that's a that's a big move. I think the. <clears throat> the, the 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 knights are set up for success going forward here now especially now that they, they have basically two really good uh, top six lines now that they picked up uh, mark stone to play with us uh, paul stasny and and max Pacioretty. so um they're going to be that uh, the the not only are the, 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 that top three in the pacific is going to be fun to watch to see who uh, who, who can uh, come out come out on top and uh, get uh, a potential easier um, first round uh, first round matchup than than having to play against one of those the other one of one of the other uh, teams in that uh, division. Um, as for winners, I think that uh, although they're they, they've struggled to to start off the the new era, I think Columbus comes out uh, looking really good. 
um, they're set up for uh, success going forward to, to get into the, the playoffs and, and make a deep run. And then uh, losers would be Ottawa because I just don't think they got enough for all three of those players, especially Mark Stone. I'm not as down on Ottawa's uh, return. I mean, everybody knew what the situation was there that it, with, with them facing a rebuild, and uh, they were in a bit of a tough spot. Uh, what what hurts, I would say, is going back even further to the DeShane deal, and now they don't have uh, what could be potentially the number one pick in the draft this year. Uh, that That's the part that I think would would have to burn for a Senators fan. Um how about Vegas? I mean, the way the way they are are set up to make deals here in their second year of existence is just uh, amazing. And uh, um, you know, if you're Seattle and you're going to have the same expansion rules, uh, you gotta you gotta really be optimistic about your chances of competing right away as well. Um, yeah, Vegas has the pieces to make the deals, and uh, other teams. If they have the pieces, they don't have the cap space, and and that's a challenge. So uh, uh, Vegas potentially maybe has has a captain in Mark Stone, uh, depending on how th- things go here the first couple of years. Um, winners, I, I like I like the move that Winnipeg made. Uh, Kevin Hayes uh, is a nice piece. He was uh, to me impressed uh, with the Rangers. Um, Winnipeg's been pretty good at at uh, making improvements without having to surrender huge amounts. Um, uh, I guess we don't even need to really talk about Edmonton. They didn't really do anything on the uh, trade deadline. Uh, Calgary, minor move there. Would have liked to see something around goaltending. I think that still makes me a little bit nervous. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I, Toronto didn't do very much. I mean, there was a lot of deals that kind of made it to the deadline, but nothing that was overly earth-shattering outside of, of who won the Mark Stone sweepstakes? I think I think uh, Nashville as well uh, did really well. Um, they didn't give up much to get Wayne Simmons, and then just did a quick swap to get Mikhail Granlund. So I think that's uh, an underrated, uh, very good uh, deadline for David Poyle. Yeah, good. A couple of really good pieces here. So I so do you think Columbus matches up with Tampa Bay? Um, no, no, because I think what Tampa Bay does really well is they've got so much depth. Uh, they've got the, the high, their high end skill is better than Columbus and then their depth is better. Cause I think you, when you, when you have a, when you have Yanni Gord, uh, set basically running your third line and he's putting up 60 points, that's, that's tough to beat. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming the matchup you want is is the Islanders in in some yeah. way, shape, or form. I don't know even if you want Washington. I that, that's but that's that's there's an interesting challenge there because you got Washington, the defending Stanley Cup champions, but you got Barry Trotz, the coach of the Stanley Cup champions, with the Islanders. I, that's kind of fascinating uh, to me. Uh, I think. I kind of, because I think you have to go with Vegas because they got the best player. And, but I really did like what Columbus did because they, as as much as they went out all in, they actually didn't give up all that much. They still got a lot of prospects. Uh, They still are, are built that they're not going to be hurt too much in the future. Um, I, uh, yeah, I think that that's interesting. That it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Columbus. My big concern with Vegas is I'm not sure if I'm completely sold on their defense overall compared to what San, both San Jose and Calgary have. I don't know if they match up very well defensively, but their forwards, I think, I think forward wise, they match up very well with, with a Mark Stone, especially with San Jose. I think they can go toe to toe with that. And they got, they got the guy that has the success in Marc Andre Fleury. So it's certainly a team I don't want to face. Wouldn't want to face in in a in a first round playoff series for sure. Uh, one of my losers is actually the Ducks because I think that there was a lot of stuff that they could have done that they didn't end up doing. I know that Cam Fowler's name was out there and a lot. I mean, I know some rumors that they, they, he was going to be traded, but there was a lot of opportunity there to kind of re, retool and reshape, and they didn't really they didn't really do a lot. 
all things because Bob Murray was too busy coaching. Yeah, that's it's, <laughs> it, 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 no. It's a good point, Kevin. Uh, they're, they're a team that that you know needs to be taking the proactive approach here to start turning over that lineup a little bit. Yeah, and they just re-signed Jakob Silverberg today. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe they still believe they got a shot, but it's. Uh, yeah, they gotta they gotta re even if they make the playoffs, they gotta start that retool at some point in time. And so it's gonna really be interesting. But I think Anaheim missed the boat. As far as Edmonton, I don't know what you were going to do. Um, because I don't think that their players have a lot of value anyway. Um, yeah. that's kinda it's it's tough. I mean, you made your Cam Talbot move and you made a whole bunch of other trades that ended up not working out. I, I don't know what Keith Gretzky was was really going to do. Um Calgary, yeah, I mean, they had the Jason Zucker trade apparently was supposed to happen, but something got happened there. Uh, you're not they ran, to, they ran on Edler, too, apparently. Yes, they were, but um, we didn't get into this, but I don't think anyone here expected Alex Edler to move, wave his no move, and I don't think that I, – I can't blame Jim Benning for not finding a way for getting Alex Edler to make what is a personal career dis- – like. Hey, Alex, do you want to be president of the company? No. Okay, well, what else are you going to, like, we'll pay you double. No. Okay, we'll pay you triple. No. Like, if he doesn't want to move, I don't know what you can do to make a guy move. Like, Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, I think in in the, the idealistic world that a lot of fans sort of live in, I think they, they're like, oh, yeah, you, you, just, you just make a move. It's it's not that. Like, I think if you look at the way you have to remember that they're 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 hum, they're humans too, and they're people too. And then you because if you, you you look at uh, look at uh, Henrik Lundqvist's uh, response to losing Zuccarello. Yeah, like, I think that that does that says everything to what uh, what this 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 time of year and this that and the trade deadline day is to to those players. It's a lot of. Un- certainty it's a lot of stress because you don't know what's going to happen so if he 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 negotiated a no trade clause because he wants to stay in vancouver that's his that's what he wants to do then i think a the 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 team needs to needs to respect that and the fans need to respect that and the fans need to respect that need to respect that the the team is doing that not uh not uh bring, bring up the pitchforks to anyone yeah, and and he and he negotiated the the no trade uh, in exchange, presumably for less salary. So it, it, it's really it, you know it's really um, just wrong, I think, for for people to sort of overlook that and say, oh yeah, you should just wave it just because. Yeah, and also I'm going to add the media because I feel like the media has been pretty hard on Benning and both Benning and Edler on this, and it's you know like. It, uh, to me, it's no different than anyone else in a career, right? You, If you want to move, you'll move. If you don't, you don't. And he's he's spent enough years and has spent enough time in this organization that he, I think he gets to, to pick his spot. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I do think the media is a bit of a conduit for the fan base, though, in term, within Vancouver specifically. Because yeah. I think you, you look at the, the, the most vocal – uh, media members, in terms of uh, the the the, the, the lead, leading the charge in the uh, let, let's trade uh, Alex Edler, they're the ones who are most uh, most sort of uh, quote unquote in touch with the vocal the vocal side of the fan base. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean the one guy that stands out to me that that's the opposite is Ian McIntyre. I mean he's been pretty consistent on reminding everybody that that. You know, Alex has the no trade, hasn't been willing to waive the no trade. There's no indication he wants to waive the no trade. I mean, he sort of reminds people of that, but then it gets forgotten about. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's more of a – McIntyre is more, more sort of just someone who who says – what he hear, what he's, what he, what he hears, and what he's been told from the uh, the organization more than um, going off on a bit of a going off on a tangent and. And uh, writing more critical, um, uh, and and reporting more critical things that are more rumors and fan and uh, speculation more than anything else. Yeah, 
and I'm not saying that there shouldn't be criticism. I, that's not what I'm saying, but I think that there's there needs to be some human element to this. I, and I, I feel like at times it's it's missing in this market a little bit. And the other thing is, let, let's be realistic. If Alex Edler was traded to Calgary, you are not getting a lot for him. There is not a right, other than Rasmus Anderson, there's not a really good right shot defenseman in, in that prospect pipe. Uh, there's no way you're getting a Valimaki. There's no way you're getting to Dylan Dubé. There's no way you're getting a Matthew Phillips. And there's no way you're getting a high draft pick. So really, how much really would you have gotten for Alex Edler at the end of the day? Would it have been worth it? Who knows? But, yeah. I mean, depends on, I guess there's other organizations too, but I mean, I guess I can see the point of getting something, but I don't know how much you really would have gotten, but Mm -hmm. Um, moving on. So Thursday was, in my opinion, it was one of the games of the year and it sounded a little bit like this. John Tavares. Oh, that was the that that was the reaction. It was more of the boos, or and but there was might have been a guy that said this. I was saying boos, but it was mostly boos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so I, I this is I understand Leafs anger, Leafs fans anger because of the way that the Islanders fans reacted. I get it. I totally feel like if if you know I get. But at the same time, the NHL does not have enough villains or f- players that cause that kind of visceral reaction when they go to a, a visiting rink. It's not the same idea like the NFL and the NBA. I I actually was so, from a big picture business point of view, I thought this was just so, I mean, this was so fascinating and fantastic to me that it led me to wonder... What would happen if, a, if the Leafs and the Islanders played in the playoffs? How fun would that series actually be? That would be a series that I honestly would be so looking forward to. And I never, I never really thought about it. Like, but they could actually play in the playoffs, and it would be that would be must see. Oh, that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. Like you thought, you thought it was nuclear. Um, on Thursday, good first uh, first two games in in uh, in Long Island uh, for the playoffs would be just uh, absolutely apoplectic in terms of the, the reaction that uh, Tavares and Elise would get. Um, I guess we can uh, dive into whether the fans are right or wrong to react the way that they did, Kevin. Yeah, are are you what were you? Or, what were your thoughts on that? Or are you okay with the fans reacting this way? The only thing I, I didn't like was objects being thrown. I mean, that's yeah. a bit of a hazard in terms of fan safety. But um, I, I guess where I'm at with this is it's just the the, the feelings. Uh, it, it seems out of if you if you pay attention to the Toronto media coverage of this, it's like, oh, why are they reacting like that? Like, they don't understand why. What do you mean you don't understand why? I mean, this was a star player that, that up and left. Yeah. You know, like, like the fans were attached to him. They And and uh, a few a couple of years ago when they got to the second round of the playoffs, I mean, he, he played really well. He was the captain of the team. Things were looking promising. And then he, you know, the, the first day of free agency – He's got the he's got the photo there with the Leafs bed sheets and signs the big contract and just says to everybody that he didn't really want to be there. I mean, he he doesn't you know he says that's not the case and I and I believe that he he gave it his all in an Islanders uniform. But it's very unusual to see franchise players drafted at the top um, change teams like this, and the fans are bitter about it. You know, uh, the, the the Islanders are the team for, for people that live on Long Island. They're passionate about the team, and uh, that was on display the other night. It was, it was, it was fascinating to, you know, to watch from afar and, and not be um, partial to one of those two teams. But, um, you know, I, I guess uh, Islanders fans felt like he dumped them, and they they were, quite frankly, pissy about it. Uh, 
you know, fans, do, fans of Vancouver give Ryan Kessler a hard time every time he comes back to Rogers Arena, and it, it's it's a similar deal. Fans uh, love the guy. He was a heart and soul guy. He was a first round pick. He, he he there were great memories from the 2011 run, and then when the going got tough, he wanted out. And people haven't forgiven him for that. Yeah, I would I would agree there, Tyler. It's uh, the the only thing I didn't like was the was the throwing. The ch- they, they got created with some of the chants, which was quite good. Yeah, I quite, I especially with the way that the Islanders are playing, the "We don't need you" chants, just loved it. <laughs> well, and then, and and then in that game too, when they're spanking the the Leafs, it's like, yeah, well, yeah, it was that was great, and we need more uh, more fun uh, sort of hostile territory uh, games like that. In, it just it adds to the atmosphere. It's why we. It's part of, part part of the reason why we love playoffs so much. Yeah. yeah, is the is the the atmosphere, the energy in the building, and we don't get that enough because the se- the season's so long. So anytime you, we can get that, uh, I, I think we need to we need to embrace it. Uh, but just uh, yeah, no throwing things. That's a bit. Uh, that, that, that crosses the line. I didn't think I'd be bringing up Sean Avery on this podcast, but I remember him saying many years ago that uh, basically what you, you've been saying, Sean, that the, the league could use some more heroes and villains type of uh, uh, type of uh, element to the league. I, I think uh, uh, I think he even said that the league doesn't need any more Jerome McGinless. And I, I do want to talk about Iggy here a little bit yeah. uh, later, but uh, – but I mean, the point was well taken. There's a there's all this, you know, uh, hockey culture and not doing things the wrong way and, and everything. And and why not have some hostility? It makes it a far more entertaining for everybody. At the same time, ever Avery was all over the Islander fans for their behavior and to to Ferris. So when Sean Avery <laughs> speaks, I tend not to listen. Sorry, <laughs> it feels like depends on the day with Sean Avery's opinion sometimes. But you yeah, know, you're right. I mean, I was thinking back. In, I know Tyler's a CFL fan. I'm sure. I don't know if Sean if is, is as much. But remember when Harry Henry Burris returned to Saskatchewan when he signed that contract with the Stampeders. Oh. That was unbelievable hostile. It was just such oh, yeah. fascinating theater to watch. And I mean, when Chris Pronger returned to Edmonton after all that happened there, I, I mean, I think that there, any fan base that would have been in the same situation that the Islander fan base would would, would have reacted pretty much the same. Now, maybe they wouldn't have thrown objects on the ice, but it would have been pretty bad. So, yeah, um, definitely. Like, like I, 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 if if Tavares had gone up and 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 left Toronto, if it was the reverse that reversed, I, I would, I could totally see the uh, see Toronto fans acting just very similar. Yeah. I mean, there was the argument about well, what happened when Ottawa lost Daniel Alfred? That was a completely different situation. Because Daniel, they knew that that was the organization's fault, not Daniel Alfredson's fault. This was a guy that yeah. made, made a choice to leave in a good, pretty, I mean, it was a situation where if he would have stayed, it would have been fine. Like, the organization was in good shape. They got a new coach. They got a new GM. They were on the way up. So, I don't think that those situations are the same. And if Jerome McGinley walked out on the Flames, you... When when he came back, there would not have been a retirement ceremony tonight. We would not be having a conversation about Toronto Gimlin's retirement. So, because that fan ba- the fan base would have booed. So I, I don't think you can compare. All of those situations are not the same. I I, I think most fan bases would have booed if, if the te- if a guy walked away. I just can't see that them reacting any different. So I don't. I'm not mad at the Islander fans for reacting that way. No, they shouldn't be throwing things, but you know. Well, not not only did he did he want to leave the Islanders and, and and play for Toronto, but he he didn't give the Islanders a chance to get any return via trade. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 a, it's a kind of a double whammy there for the fans. But yeah. uh, you know, as they were mentioning, without him. Yeah. Yeah. The, and yeah. The, and I think the and the funny thing is, is, is coming out of that game, there are more questions about the Toronto Maple Leafs and what happens with them in the playoffs than the New York Islanders. And I, I, I like it. That's quite fascinating. What ha- what is happening in Toronto yeah. uh, going forward? Cause um, 
there's a 20% chance. I mean, I think they're making the playoffs, but they are they are not a team that I, I don't know if they're as much as a contender. We, we can get into this another time because I think there's – Yeah. But I don't know if they're as, as much of a contender as people thought that they were. Oh, well, I would just say very quickly, I mean, at, at this moment, I, I'm not sure I'd, I'd make them a favorite to win the, in the first round against anybody. No, I wouldn't either. Yeah, their defense is uh, is not uh, not up to snuff. No, no, and I yeah, and I I think there's questions about the kind of the character of this team too, um, which is that's it's fascinating. Um, and just so that I, I, before we get I, before we get to Aginla, if Mike Babcock doesn't win this round win around, I think that that hot seat's becoming a little bit hotter in Toronto. I. I, I yeah, mean, potentially. Yeah, I think it, it'll get a little bit hotter. A little, not super hot, but they'll be starting to get some questions. Um, we were going to talk about Guy Boucher, but I, I, I think Tyler's right. I, I think, um, I, I don't know what else there really is to say about Ottawa if, um, if, anyway, because I think that that's such a, it, it, that's such a mess. Uh, but Jerome McGinn was... Um, we, we did a whole podcast on Jerome again a few few months ago that you you can go back and listen to and I'll, I'll put in the in the information here. But Jerome Ginla's uh, number is being retired today. Uh, there's going to be a pretty big ceremony in Calgary. Uh, Sean's in Calgary now. Um, it's also nine years ago this week that Jerome McGinley assisted on one of the greatest goals in Canada's history, the Golden Goal, that happened right here. Uh, right in Vancouver, Sidney Crosby scored for Get Canada the gold medal. Um, let's maybe, yeah, let's talk a little bit about what we remember about Jerome. Um, from you guys being Canuck fans more than me being Flames fans. Um, let's talk. Let, let maybe talk a little bit more about Jerome again uh, to end this off. What your memories are? I he was such a good player and uh, hated the. Uh, the Canucks always had had a, had, had trouble uh, containing him, and and just because he was so dynamic. And uh, one thing I, I think he deserves a lot of credit of credit for was after the the uh, 04 lockout, um, after the first cup season, after that uh, when he realized that the the new rules and everything meant meant the game started to get faster, he changed up his training his training program in the summer and got lighter and faster as opposed to being uh, heavier and, and, and bulkier to, because that's, that, that was the way the game was going. And uh, that extended his career, I think, uh, at least a couple, a couple of years. I drove again, left playing for a rival of the Canucks all those years in Calgary uh, and, and being so effective against the Canucks, but still hard to hate. You know, I mean, the guy did everything the right way. Uh, he always, he loved to fight, you know, he wore the sea, he loved to fight. He, he scored goals. He fought, he did everything, you know, um, the way he, he led the Flames uh, to the Stanley Cup final in 2004, uh, the fact that he and, and the Flames came up short, it, to me, is one of those kind of regrettable things to, to have watched. Uh, they, they really deserve that one. Um, and, and then, obviously, the international accomplishments, uh, some great memories there. I mean, he, he, uh, he was big in the 2002 Salt Lake City gold medal yes. game as well. Um, just at 250 goal seasons, and then of course the the night of Trevor Linden's final game. I mean, for for Canuck fans, uh, they were they're missing the playoffs. That night was all about Linden. The Canucks got smoked by the Flames. Uh, Aginla managed to get number 50 that night, and then uh, and then the way he brought the whole team back out onto the ice to shake hands with Trevor Linden. I mean, Jerome Aginla did everything with class. Uh, uh, he was fierce. Uh, and, and, and always showed up in the big moments. And he's just for a guy that never played in a Canucks uniform. He's one of my all time favorites. Yeah, it's, I, I, I mean, he's, he, he will go down as one of my all time favorite flames. I mean, I think now when you think of the flames, you, you, you think of again, I think, and in the big stage and Kipper's off, um, but I mean, he just was such a big part of the team. I mean, he was the heart and soul, um, it, you knew no matter who who we play that again like we have a Ginla. When you have a Ginla, you have a chance. And he, I mean, he gave a class to this organization, and he gave an identity to this organization to just like lacked it for for a good ten, twelve years. I mean, 
Yeah, there was Theo, but Theo never really brought that. Ginla just brought something different. Like, Ginla was, Flurry was, I think that Flames fans a little bit understood why you hated Theron Flurry. Because if Theron Flurry was on your team, you would have hated him too. <laughs> like flames, you know, but yeah. it, it's Ginla just brought a different level of class, and I'm really glad that they're going. They're not going with the forever of flame. I'm really glad that they decided to actually retire this number, give him the honor that he he deserved. Because I I think he's like I I mean I think he was the epitome of what we hoped that the Calgary Flames organization was. Um, I certainly think he was the best guy to ever play uh, play with the team, in my opinion. Um, I and yeah, and I think his international accomplishments. He's going to be in the. I mean, it's going to be great to see the Sedins and again will be in the Hall of Fame at the same time. I think that that'll be that's great. And um, yeah, and it, I I do think even though there's a rivalry, there's such an interesting connection with how, especially the Flames and Canucks, like Sedins again, like guys that. I think epitomized the class and the integrity of what the game is. And yeah, we just talked about needing villains. And the reason we need more villains is because we have, as Sean Avery said, we need, we, there are too many Jerome Aginlas, Um but we need Jerome Aginlas. And I think that that's one of the advantages, you know, that the NHL has over other sports organizations is they have class acts like Jerome Aginlas. And I'm glad he's getting the honor and respect that he deserves. I don't know if you guys have it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. What uh, what Aginla meant to the to the organization and the the, the city of Calgary um, just transcends um, what uh, just a hockey player usually is. I think that uh, he just he's a he's a he's just someone special in the in the because of who he is as a person he became something bigger than um than just a hockey player and and just need and and everyone understood that and he it was understood through from throughout the league and that's the same thing with the Sedins. so i think it's just it's going to be very fitting and and very uh it's this is a, a very special day uh in in in, in hockey history for uh to to see uh, Icky uh, get his uh his uh, number retired here uh, at the Saddle Dome. Yeah. And John, I mean you're in Calgary. I mean you you you'll see people around the city all the time wearing Flames uniforms. I mean I I I would guess that a large percentage if not the largest percentage of people have number 12 on the on the back of that jersey. The the, the, the way this guy was was loved and and like we talked about here sort of uh, epitomized what it was like to be a Calgary Flame back in those days. Yeah. It's just uh, the the one. It's, he's a. Uh, I, I would say the, the way. I think what what we all say about uh, the what the the uh, Oilers are doing with McDavid, potentially doing with McDavid, and 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 wasting away his uh, his career is that uh, unfortunately uh, they never they never found that that right uh, top uh, elite center for for Jerome to play with, and unfortunately that. Uh, that held him back and he was never able to, to win that cup. That is such it. That is sad. That is, it is a sad thing. Like that, that opportunity was, um, was, was wasted. And I mean, the Daryl Sutter GM years, we can like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, that was quite a, that was an adventure enough, but yeah, it's really sad that he never got that cup. And I mean, it's sad that the Sedins never got it too, but like, it, it is sad for him, not only for the Flames or fan base, but for him. And, you know, we were hoping he would get that cup in Pittsburgh or Boston and he never, he unfortunately never got it in it. That, that is sad, but I, it's, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a guy that, that everybody, you know, I, I, he's one of those guys that I think one of the few guys in the NHL that's like, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a team fan, but I could be a Jerome Ginla fan. So whatever team he yeah. ends up on, I will cheer for. Yeah. All right. Uh, we covered a lot. Did I miss anything? I don't think no, so. I think, yeah, I think that's good. All right. Uh, Sean, how do we follow you? I am Beardy Connect zero three on Twitter. All right, and Tyler, I'm at T Noble T N O B L E. All right, and of course you can follow me at K E V O L E 
unsubscribe to all podcasts, iTunes, and Spotify. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Sean and Chaya, for coming on. And we will talk to you all soon. Bye for now.